Well, good morning, everyone. The Lord is risen. Uh, we didn't get it. We didn't get it. We're far too slow. It's been a year <laughs> since you first practiced, and also we lost the hour. So the response should be, the Lord is risen indeed. So good morning, everyone. The Lord is risen. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's the Church of Ireland service over. Now we'll start the free P1. Uh, we're turning to the hymn 120, a great theme for Easter in this hymn. We could sing it every day and every Lord's Day of every year for its a resurrection day, but especially appropriate for today, the hymn 120. Let me welcome you all before we stand to sing in the Saviour's great name. Thank you for joining with us upstairs and down. We do have quite a number of our folks away. They're up in uh, Port Rush, somewhere away in holiday. Uh, two at least are away on honeymoon and uh, others have joined with us. So if you're here as a visitor, a regular worshipper, we're delighted to see you. And also to those that are joining with us on the online stream, we're glad to see you and we trust the Lord. Well, we're glad to welcome you and we trust the Lord will bless you richly in the Saviour's name. I'd also like to say a very special and warm welcome to our sister Thelma Strange. Thelma's just sitting at the back. It's lovely to see Thelma in. And uh, I'm sure many of you will be able to say hello to her a little later on. But Thelma, we're delighted. This has been a, a wonderful day. It's been an answer to prayer. And uh, we know when you first took on well, uh, all those months ago and a long time, uh, we wondered if you would be back in the house of the Lord. And we prayed for that day. We talked about it in hospital, in your own home, that maybe someday we'll see you here. And what a joy it is to have you with us today. And it is a wonderful answer to prayer, folks. It's a token of, we believe, God's goodness in answering prayer that our sister Thelma is with us. And there are many others who need our prayers and our thoughts are with them also today. After the uh, first note, we're going to stand together as we sing. <laughs>
the Lord. That's good singing, and we always appreciate that. Let's just bow briefly in prayer, and we'll seek the Lord's face. We'll commit our way unto the Lord this Easter morning. Father, we thank Thee for a sense of the divine presence. We thank Thee, Lord, for Thy love and mercy toward us. We rejoice in the goodness and grace, the loving kindness and the gentleness of our God. We praise Thee, even though Thou art holy, even though Thou art just and Thou art true, and yet, Lord, we know Thou art righteous altogether, and we know, Lord, You will not acquit the guilty, and You will not pardon sin of itself. We recognize, O God, that Thou art a God of mercy, a God of infinite compassion and a God of love, one who cares, the one who is loving kindness, is uh, everlasting. We praise Thee, Lord, that in love and in mercy and in grace Thou hast provided a substitute, Thou hast provided a way of salvation. We bless Thee, Lord, that Thou hast devised means whereby Thy banished ones may return again and be reconciled to the King. We bless Thee, Father, for the design of the Gospel, that God so loved this world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And we ask, Lord, even now that we will uh, see the Lord Jesus Christ high and lifted up. We will recognize that he is the only Savior. He's the mediator between God and man. He's the man Christ Jesus, God veiled in human flesh. And we bless thee, our Father, uh, for the cross, the place where Christ suffered, bled and died. We thank thee for that one great sacrifice to put away sin forever. We rejoice, O God, that he has atoned for sin. He has paid the price. We thank thee for that sacrifice once for all, uh, the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise thee, Father, that he has made an end of sin. We thank thee that by his own death on the cross, he gave himself a ransom price for sin. He is the sacrifice, just as the Old Testament high priest and priests offered a sacrifice, the high priest of the new covenant offered himself the sacrifice. We praise thee, Father, it was not the priest who offered, but the priest who was the sacrifice upon the cross. And we rejoice, our Father, that he is now alive forevermore. Uh, Lord, we behold the place where he lay. He is not here. He is, he is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. And we thank thee, our Father, he's exalted to thy right hand. There he sits because his work is finished. We rejoice he ever lives in the power of an endless life. God and man and two distinct natures and one unique person, the Redeemer of God's elect and the Savior of the world. We rejoice at thy right hand. He is making intercession for us, and we praise thee by virtue of his finished work and shed blood. He's prepared a place for all who repent and believe in heaven forevermore, and one day he's returning to this earth. Soon and very soon we're going to see the King. We shall see the King in all his glory, in all of his beauty, in all of his majesty, we shall gaze upon the one who hung upon the cross, now exalted, now glorified. We shall look into his face. We shall see the marks of Calvary in his hands, in his feet, and upon his side. We bless thee, Father, that our Savior, who, Lord, suffered such shame and ignominy of men, will one day be crowned before the entire earth as King of the universe. We praise thee, Father, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But until then, Lord, we are to occupy till he come. Help us, Lord, as we serve thee in this sin-cursed world. Help us, Lord, as we live uh, to thy praise and glory. Give to us that help, the infilling of the Spirit, the cleansing of the precious blood from all our sins. Wash us and make us whole and clean today, for we have sinned against thee as a a congregation, as individual believers, Lord. We have transgressed. We have sinned. We are cold at heart at times. We're backslidden at times. We confess our lack of love for thee and our fellow man. And upon those two great commandments hang all the law and prophets, all that is required of mankind hang upon those two great commandments. And we have sinned against thee. And we acknowledge our sin. We have failed thee. And we acknowledge it today. And Lord, we bow humbly and plead the merit of the blood for cleansing. We ask, Lord, you'll wash and make the vessel clean today. Give to us clean hands and a pure heart. Grant to us grace and help to live the Christian life. And the vessels cleansed by blood, 
be pleased to infill now with thy blessed Holy Spirit. May we know what it is to be anointed to serve and to worship and to war and work for Christ. We pray, Lord, you'll bless each head bowed, each home represented. Thou knowest the need, thou God seest me. Pray for those who were saved, born, in, born again of thy Spirit. Encourage their heart today. Lift them up and build them up in their most holy faith. Give them a word in season from thyself and thy truth today. And remember those who are, Lord, perhaps cold at heart, maybe at a distance from thee, just in the busyness of life, they've left off those things that are needful. And Lord, they probably feel themselves at a distance from thee. May this be the very moment right now and they return to first love again, where they get right with God, that they will, Lord, just seek after the Lord again and begin again with thee. Lord, we pray that you'll remember those who are out of Christ without a Savior, those who are still in their sin, those who are lost, those who are perishing. And if they were to die now, or, Lord, you were to return, they would be lost in hell. They'd be cast into the lake of fire. And we cry unto thee for the rescuing, <coughs> ransoming, and redeeming of lost, precious souls. We pray, Lord, you'll call sinners effectually through the gospel to repentance and faith. And we ask that you'll save the lost. We thank thee for last Sunday evening for the restoration of James. We thank thee, Lord, he's going on with thee. He'll be out in the house of God today. We thank thee for others who were in that you've saved this past while. We thank thee, Lord, for even those who were in out of Christ, that you preserve their lives. And we pray, Lord, you will continue to remember them. Remember that young girl, Amber. We thank thee, Lord, you preserved her life. And we pray, Lord, you will speak to her heart today, convict her of her sin, bring her to that place where she will, Lord, turn and seek the Lord and find Christ. Remember her mother, Lord, and the concern she has. You know how distraught she's been. And we pray, Lord, you'll minister even to the need there. So, Lord, hear our prayer. We thank thee, Lord, for thy hand upon us. Thank thee for our sister Thelma being amongst us today. What a wonderful answer to prayer that is. And, Lord, streams of mercy never ceasing. They call now for songs of loudest praise. God has answered prayer, and we acknowledge it today. And we give all the praise and the honor and the glory to God. Comfort those who mourn today. Comfort those who are sick, Lord, and draw near. Give the healing touch, and if it's not not thy will to heal. Then we pray, Lord, if the sickness or the illness, Lord, is to be protracted, then so, Lord, we pray for a sufficient grace, Lord. We pray for strength and help and fortitude of mind and heart and soul and spirit. And we pray for lifting up for the downcast. So hear our prayer today and pour out thy spirit upon us. Remember our country. Remember our nation. We pray for our land. We pray for our province. We pray for mercy from God. We pray, Lord, for a heaven-sent sky blue revival of the Spirit of God. We pray that Christ, O oh God, will be uplifted and, Lord, exalted even among the people, and that even in the town of Cumber, Lord, the local area, there'll be a visitation of the Spirit, that sinners would be converted, and thy great name honored and glorified. So thank thee today, Father, for a risen Savior, one who has conquered sin and death and hell and the grave, and we rejoice he's alive forevermore, and he lives within our hearts. So, Lord, presence thyself among us now. Bless our sister congregations, many outside our denomination, faithful to the blood and book. Grant, Lord, where every faithful ambassador stands behind the sacred desk, the Lord will pour out his spirit. Take of our thanks, too, for Thursday. We thank thee for the wedding over in Money Slain. We thank thee for a sense of the divine presence. And we pray, Lord, you remember Isaac and Hannah today, the McKee and the Skelly family circles. We pray, Lord, you will lead this young couple couple on with thyself as they have begun married life as two born-again Christians, so they may keep Christ at the heart of their marriage and their home, and that thou would richly bless all our young people, our children, the little lambs of this flock, our young adults, our seniors, and every single individual associated with the congregation. Remember the online community, minister to their need today as well, and Father, in answer now to prayer, be pleased to take up our thanks and above all, for so great salvation, we offer this our prayer with thanksgiving in our Savior's precious and worthy name. Amen. Let's turn in our Bibles to Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, please. Mark's Gospel, the chapter 16. We 
We're going to commence to read at the very first verse, Mark chapter 16 and the verse 1. Mark 16, verse 1, let us all hear the word of the Lord. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulchre? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter, that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulchre, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. And after that he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they them. Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. <coughs> and he said unto them, Go into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. And we know the Lord will indeed bless the public reading of his own precious and infallible word. I'm going to ask our clerk of session if he'll come forward. He's going to make some necessary announcements. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. It is good to see you out at the house of God, a good number out uh, this nice, bright uh, Sunday morning. Uh, we welcome you in the Saviour's name, and of course, especially glad to see Thelma in the corner there. Uh, that certainly is an answer to prayer and an encouragement uh, to us all. Now, I, uh, I think I must have been affected by the loss of an hour's sleep last night because I forgot to pick up uh, my announcements as it was coming out. But I think they're fairly straightforward, uh, and I'm sort of winging it this morning, uh, but uh, we'll get there. Do you remember that we're meeting around the Lord's table uh, after our service this morning? And of course, all who know the Lord and are seeking to walk with him, uh, you are warmly invited to remain with us uh, for that time of fellowship around the Lord's table. Uh, this evening service, of course, at 7 p.m. Again, our gospel service. Keep that in mind. Uh, then, of course, uh, it is the Easter weekend. Do remember that 
the final uh, meeting uh, of the Easter Convention up in the Martyrs Memorial is tomorrow evening, uh, starting at 7 p.m., that uh, Easter Convention uh, rally. So do keep that in mind. I know that there have been good meetings uh, so far. Uh, then our prayer meeting, because of the uh, holiday period, will not be on Tuesday. It'll be on Wednesday at 8 p.m. Uh, Friday then, the Youth Fellowship at 8 o'clock, uh, 10 p.m., the men's prayer meeting. Uh, next Lord's Day, the service is at the usual time, a quarter past 10, uh, Sunday school and Bible class, the two services, half past 11 and 7 p.m. Uh, and God willing, uh, our, uh, yes, uh, at the evening service, uh, next Lord's Day, our sister, uh, Miss Charlotte uh, Cochie from Port of Ogie will be ministering in song. Uh, a couple of other things then, little bits of paper, paper have been given. Uh, seniors, believe it or not, we're, our next meeting is coming up, uh, not so far away, so uh, Friday the 12th of April, will be our next seniors meeting. Starts at 11.30 a.m., of course, and the speaker will be the Reverend David McMillan. Uh, and we do request, as usual, uh, that if you're able to come, you add your name to the list there in the hall of the church for catering purposes, uh, so that you'll uh, get your lunch afterwards. Uh, so do keep that in mind. Uh, then a preliminary announcement in relation to uh, the next Breakfast Bible Club here in the church. Uh, that, of course, involves uh, the Sunday school, uh, those who attend the Sunday school, uh, the Tuesday night meeting as well, and the youth fellowship all gather together for the Bible uh, Breakfast Club. Uh, and that will be on Saturday the 20th of April. Uh, so do uh, remember that. Of course, the bus goes around uh, from about a quarter past nine. Uh, so young folk, keep that in mind and do remember uh, that uh, breakfast club. Thank you. We do thank our brother very much indeed for making those announcements. I'm not sure if it was mentioned, but our sister Vivian McCoy will be ministering in song this evening. We're turning to the hymn 121 before we come to the preaching of God's Word. It may not be a familiar hymn as such, but hopefully the tune uh, will be familiar. Bless morning, whose first dawning rays beheld the Son of God arise triumphant from the grave and leave his dark abode. We'll stand after the key and we'll sing all of the hymn, please.
Mark's Gospel then in the chapter 16. I just say that there, there is no youth fellowship next Friday evening. They're taking a break and it will resume the following Friday. So next Friday week it will be the youth fellowship. Keep that in mind, no youth fellowship next Friday evening. Mark chapter 16 and I just want to leave the words of verse 6 with you. Uh, the angel said unto these ladies, he said, And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. Amen. Just to check with the media team, is this one working okay, Paul? Okay, we're on the, the radio mic. Father in heaven, we thank thee now for the reading of Holy Scripture. We praise thee for this text that is before us just now. And as we come to preach and to meditate, as we come, Lord, to even seek counsel from, the God, from God from the text, we pray you'll bless us richly. Pray you'll encourage our hearts, Lord. Pray you'll strengthen our faith. Lord, speak to saint and sinner alike. Speak to the saved and the unsaved. Speak to, O oh God, each individual from the youngest child to the oldest individual gathered in the house or listening through the online stream or even will hear a little later on the message. Grant, Lord, you will speak with a voice that wakes the dead. Bid thy people hear. Open our eyes to behold wondrous things from out of thy law. I pray, Lord, that thou will wash even our eyes with the eye salve of the Spirit of God. Illuminate the page for us today. Lord, make it simple. Make it clear. Make it plain. Grant, Lord, there'll be nothing obscure, Lord. There'll be nothing, Lord, complicated. There'll be no corruption of the pure Word of God. We pray to this end thou would create that highway whereby the Word of the Lord would run and have free course and be glorified in all of our hearts. To this end, Father, prepare the heart of all who hear Lord, we ask that you'll take away every distraction and wandering thought and give to me, the preacher, a Lord, clean hands and a purified heart through the blood of Christ. Wash me, O Lamb of God. Wash me from sin and by thine atoning blood. Lord, make me thy servant clean and grant to me, O God, I pray, the mighty infilling and anointing of the Holy Spirit of God. Give to me that help from above and grant, Lord, in all things Christ will be seen, uplifted and honoured and glorified. To this end now, draw near to us and shut us in with thyself. Gather us like Mary at the feet of the Master and may we receive the word from thy mouth today. Counsel our hearts, speak to our souls. Bless us richly, Father, we pray. And Father, in answer now to prayer, be pleased to glorify thy dear Son and the people of God said, Amen. You know, there is one single word that is used with great frequency in connection with the resurrection of Christ. Now, if you're trying to think of that word, you might get it. I'm sure some most definitely will. Others might struggle. But it is a word that I do believe that it can be used in conjunction basically with any doctrine of the Bible. If we were to follow the word in Scripture from the Old Testament uh, to the New, I believe it would make a tremendous series. We could deal with so many aspects of Christian doctrine and teaching and instruction using this one single word. Remember, the Word of God is inspired. It is inerrant. It is infallible. And so when the Lord introduces a word in connection with any doctrine, especially a fundamental doctrine, then that single word carries with it authority and weight. And the Lord would have us to look at that word. And I believe in connection with the resurrection, there is a single little word that is used of God to even speak to our hearts. That one word that is used with great frequency in connection with the resurrection is the word Behold, behold. You have it here in Mark chapter 16 and the verse 6. Look what the angel said in the phrase at the end of that verse. He says, he is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. Behold. And another uh, gospel, I think it's Matthew, it literally says, come, come and see. And that is the phrase. That's how the phrase is properly interpreted. In other words, come, I want you to see this. 
In Scripture, you will find many different characters. You will find many events. You will find many things, doctrines and teaching and passages and individuals that are introduced by this word, behold. I want just to confine my thoughts to the resurrection of Christ. It's as though God himself under inspiration has put into his word this word today for us. And it literally means this. I want you to stop for a minute. I want you to stop for a moment. I want you to take a closer look at this. Uh, there's something I want to show you. If you were in someone's house and they said to you, look, come into this other room. I have something I want you to see. There's something you need to see. You need to see this. Or even someone looking out the window in their home, uh, maybe something going on in the street, they would call their family, quickly, come, come do you see this? You have to see this. Look at you're drawing their attention to something, something that is important, something that you want them to see. In other words, the Lord says of the resurrection today, I want you to take a closer look at this. I want you to study this. I want you to not... Something ...important that I want you to observe... In other words, he wants you to ponder well what is written. He wants you to think about what is being said. He's bringing to your attention something that is important. It's as though the Lord says to you today, and would you not if the Lord appeared and he spoke to you personally, and he says, I want to show you something. Would you not be interested in what the Lord wants to show you? And what the Lord wants to bring to your attention? What he wants for you as a child or as a young person or as a young adult or as a senior, that the Lord wants to show you something today, whether you're saved or you're unsaved. And he takes this word, behold, because he's looking for your attention. Why did the angel say, behold? Could they not already see? Of course they could, but they couldn't perceive. They couldn't understand. And the angel called their attention again because their minds were everywhere but on an empty tomb. They couldn't understand what has happened here. Why is the stone rolled away? Why are those linen clothes lying on their own? And why is that napkin that would have covered the face and the head of Christ the Messiah, why is it folded up and laid by itself? I don't understand this. And the angel then speaks to those ladies and he says, Behold, I want you to see this. I want you to understand this. You're not going to leave this sepulcher until you understand what has actually happened here. In other words, I want you to see something. I want to show you something. It's as though the Lord's reminding us all today that you're not to miss the significance what has been recorded concerning the Lord Jesus Christ in his resurrection. And so today, it is my task under God to bring to your attention the beholds of the resurrection, the beholds of the resurrection. The first one we find here in Mark chapter 16 and the verse 6, where it actually says, behold the place. That's the first one. Behold the place where they laid him. And in another passage, Mark or Matthew, it says, come, come and see the place where the Lord led, where he once was. He's not there. He's alive. He's risen. As he said unto you, behold the place. Have a look at it. It's the last time you'll be here. You'll not have to return here. False religions, they have their caskets, they have their saints, they have their religious leaders, they have them entombed. You can go to their tomb, you can go to their grave, you can actually go to open caskets, you can go to certain so-called uh, chapels and churches, and they have relics. I was down in the south of Ireland. We were down uh, for a few days, myself and my wife and the Reverend Ian Kenny and his wife. And as we were traveling, he says to me, we'll stop off at Drogheda because I want to go to the chapel. And I thought to myself, well, you'll go on your own. <laughs> 
No, he says, I, I, there's something that you, I want you to see. And I says, what is it? He says, it's not only all that's in there, but they say they've got the skull of Oliver Plunkett. It's the last skull I ever wanted to see. And how they knew it was his, I don't know. But they had him encased. And then around that skull of Oliver Plunkett, there were all these candles lit. Then there was a statue of Mary and all the candles were lit. Then there were other saints and all the candles were lit. And then there was a supposed image of Christ and there was about two candles lit. And it showed you the emphasis of the Roman Catholic Church and while I don't agree in lighting candles, I don't agree in images, but if you were to take their religion as it stood in that chapel, their emphasis was on a saint, so-called Oliver Plunkett, and on the Virgin Mary, and all those candles symbolized that they were praying to those people, and Christ who is the mediator, Christ who is the redeemer, Christ who is God worthy of praise and honor. I, I tell you, he was left to the side. I told you, I don't agree with those things, but if you were to take it as it stands in their religion, their religion is emphasized by the worship of saints. In fact, it's idolatry. I stand over that. It's idolatry. It is the worship of a human being. It is the worship of a woman. It is the worship of of a man. Now the Jews would say to you, as they have said to us, they say this, and they say looking into your face, a Jew today, if you met a Jew today, he will say to you, you are an idolater. And I'll tell you something, that shook me up when I heard a Jew say that. That really shook me up recently. When a Jew said to a born again believer, you're an idolater because you worship a man. Jesus Christ is a man, and you worship a man. We worship God. I disagree. They don't. Very few Jews worship God. In fact, the Jewish state and the land of Israel and the Jewish nation is secular. It's secular. And if they say they worship God, where's their sacrifice? Where's their way of approach to Jehovah God as he revealed to them in the old covenant? Where is it today? It's not there. They cannot and they do not worship God. But I'll tell you this, I disagree with what the Jews say. We don't worship a man. We worship the God man. We worship God veiled in human flesh. We, we, we worship deity veiled in our humanity who is our Savior, our Lord, as Thomas said, and our God. And here we have, behold, the place. The Lord wants us to look here. We don't have to return to the tomb. I know people go to the land of they like to go to the God. I know they like to go to Calvary. I know they like to go to the empty tomb. And I know they like to look in and even see the sign he is risen. And they like to do that. But we don't need to frequent. We don't need to go on any pilgrimage. We don't need to go for healing. We don't need to go for forgiveness. We don't need to go to find peace with God. We don't need to go to Jerusalem and to a casket that even may have the bone of Jesus Christ, whether his shoulder, arm, or his leg, or even the skull, or even a piece of his garment, which they would say has miraculous powers. No, we don't need to go there to find ourselves or peace with God because he's not there. This is the last time you'll visit this place, but I want you to take a picture of it in your mind. It's empty. He's not here. He's gone. As he said unto you, he's alive forevermore. These women were told to look closely at the place where the body of Jesus Christ lay. It's not there. They wondered, who shall roll the stone away for us? Such a huge stone. When they got there, they found that place, the stone was rolled away. It wasn't taken away. It wasn't rolled away by an angel to let Christ out. An earthquake came. And an angel came, and two angels sat, one at the head, one at the foot, of where the body of Jesus Christ lay. And the stone was rolled away to let the ladies in, to let Peter and John in, to have a look into the empty tomb. It wasn't there. It wasn't rolled away to let Christ out. I want to tell you, Christ rose through those grave clothes, and Christ rose through those rocks. 
He even appeared in the upper room and he literally passed through those walls in the upper room and he appeared in the midst of them. He didn't come through the door. So the, the stone wasn't rolled away to let Christ out. Christ rose through those grave clothes. That's why Peter, when he ran in, and he ran in and he saw the grave clothes lying. Remember, they had spices. They embalmed the body of Christ. Those ladies embalmed. And he was laid in that open sepulcher and that tomb. And the stone was there and the seal was put upon it. And the stone was rolled away to let people in to see that he had risen from the dead and that he was alive forevermore. And these ladies were to ponder well because they must go quickly and tell what they had seen. And they had to observe that he's not there. And the linen clothes that he was wrapped in, they're lying there. And the napkin, which is a separate garment which covered his face and his entire head, was taken. And you could just see the picture as they were examining and looking and beholding. He has risen through those clothes. They're exactly where he lay. But the napkin that was on his face, he has taken. And he has folded it. And he has laid it to the side. And that's what convinced Peter when he saw the linen clothes lying. And here's what it says, and the napkin, the separate piece, folded, set aside. So the Lord's saying, Peter, this will help your faith. I want you to behold this scene. I want these words to sink deep into the hearts. An empty tomb, a risen Christ, he is risen. He's not here. Behold, look carefully. Come and see for yourselves the place where they laid him. He is not here. He is risen. He's alive forevermore. Jesus Christ appeared to John on the Isle of Patmos, and he said to John, look at me. I am he that was dead. He died for our sins. But I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of hell, and I have the keys of death. And the kingdom is mine, John. And I am Lord. And I'm coming in power and glory. And I'm going to reveal to you my coming kingdom in the book of the Revelation. That is the unveiling of the future for Christ and His people. He's not here. Now the application to us today is this. This is the message of Easter to believers and even to those that are unsaved. was delivered for our offenses that he was delivered to the wrath of God. He was handed over for God's justice to be meted out in our sins on his sinless body. And therefore he was delivered for our offenses, but he was raised again for our justification. In other words, the resurrection means that the work that he finished on the cross is accepted in God's sight and before heaven on your behalf. Maybe there's a child of God today and you've been struggling with the assurance of your salvation. It doesn't go on your feelings. If it went on feelings, listen to me, you'd be saved one day and you'd be lost the next. And as we heard last night in the martyrs, on a Monday morning, every preacher would be lost. If we go on feelings... But I want to tell you the resurrection of Christ is a guarantee... That God has accepted on your behalf for you the sacrifice of his cross. And if Christ is not risen, Paul told the church at Corinth, then our faith is in vain. Totally a waste of time if Christ is not risen. But Christ is risen. Therefore, we were exhorted last evening to be steadfast, and that's our motto text, and to be unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for your work in the Lord is not in vain. Think of it. Do you doubt today, child of God, whether your sins are dealt with, whether your sins are forgiven? The devil reminds you of them. The devil brings them up to you. He tells you how bad you are. He reminds you of the sins when you were a child, as a young person. He reminds you of the things that you've said about people. He reminds you of how you feel the Lord. He tells you what a bad person you are. And he tells you that God couldn't deal with your sins. And anyway, you haven't truly repented. I want to tell you something. It's not what we have done. It's what he has done. The work that he finished. Do you doubt, child of God, that the Lord loves you? That Christ died for you? Well, behold 
the place where he, he was led. He's gone. He's in heaven there for you. He presents the sacrifice and blood. It's accepted before the Father. And all who come to God through him and trust in him, their sins are forgiven. They have peace with God. And today you are invited by the Lord to behold once again the place where he lay. Have a good look today at the empty tomb. He's not there. He's risen. And that means there's forgiveness for you. There's peace with God for you. And God has accepted the sacrifice on your behalf and your sins are gone forgiven. They're buried in a, in a Sadducee's grave where there's no resurrection. The message of Easter today for you is behold the place. To all believers, the sacrifice has been accepted. In Christ we're saved eternally. Our sins are forgiven and we have everlasting peace with God. Behold the place. I want you to notice secondly, there's another behold. Turn over to Matthew chapter 28. It's still the same uh, portion in the sense of theme. And it's just another take from Matthew. Matthew who records the resurrection of Christ in great detail. And he just adds a little bit in here by using the word behold. If you look at Matthew 28 and the verse 7, look what it says. Or verse 6, he is not here for he is risen. As he said, come, that is, behold, see the place where the Lord lay. And verse 7, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There ye shall see him. Behold, that word low is the same word. Behold, I have told you. Behold, he goeth before you. Behold his presence. Behold the place. And now the Lord says, behold his presence. He goeth before you. You've got to leave the empty tomb behind. You've got to go to Galilee. It's there that something special will happen. And you're going to see something. And you're going to hear something. And you're going to receive something that will transform and change your life entirely. That will drive out the fear that you have of the Jews. You're hiding in the upper room. You're afraid of persecution. But that's not my will for your life. Behold the place. I'm alive. But go and behold my presence in Galilee. For it's there I will do something special. I will do something that will change your life completely. And what is the Lord doing here in this? Behold, I'll tell you what he's doing. He's leading them out of fear and discouragement. That's what he's doing. He's leading them to a place of victory from the place of what they thought was death and defeat, the empty tomb. To each disciple, the sepulcher represented an end to their hopes and dreams. Everything they had hoped for lay buried in that tomb. Now it's empty. Christ is not there. They're confused. Behold the place. Where is he? And then he says, he goeth before you. Quickly, tell the disciples to go to Galilee. You know the place where he told you he would meet with you. You know the place that he said after he was dead and was raised again from the dead. Then he would go to Galilee and you would meet him there. Now gather those disciples and get to Galilee. He's there. He's waiting on you. Behold his presence. You will see the risen Savior. You will encounter the risen Lord. And it will transform your life entirely. He was leading them to a greater realization of his will for their lives. A greater revelation of himself and his power over death and the grave. A fuller revelation awaited them and was to be experienced in Galilee. From there, Christ would breathe on them. From there, he would give to them the promise of the Father, the gift of the Holy Ghost, which we will deal with in a moment or two. And child of God, I want you to, to notice this. Where are you with the Lord this morning? Yes, you've been to the cross. That's true. You are saved. Your sins are forgiven you. You've looked into that empty tomb so many times and you know he's alive forevermore and you know he's in heaven exalted and he's coming back as Lord and King. You may have followed him even to Galilee. 
You may have even gone a little further than others have, but I want to tell you there's a higher and there's a greater experience for the child of God because Christ is alive forevermore. You need to meet him in Galilee where he will bless your life, where he will reveal his will to you, where he will send you forth into the harvest fields because at Galilee, it was there he empowered them. It was there that he revealed his will to them. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And lo, I am with you. You'll have my presence just as you see me now. I will still be with you. The eye of faith will behold. Lo, I am with you always. Now therefore go and go into all the world and tell them of a risen Savior that the work of salvation is complete and preach the gospel to every creature. And lo, I am with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I departed for a little season. I died. I rose again. And I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And at Galilee, they had restored to them the very presence and fellowship with their Savior and their Messiah, the Christ of God, the Son of the living God. Those who remained at the empty tomb, those who stood there looking in, wondering, questioning, reasoning, were full of discouragement. They were full of defeat. And many a Christian is like that. They've never got beyond the tomb. And it seems they're always defeated. They can never overcome their sin. They can never overcome temptation. It seems that they fall foul to the devil and to sin and to temptation all the time. But I want to tell you something. You can live in the Lord's presence You can know the will of God for your life and you can have the help of God. I'll move on just to uh, join these two points together so you'll see he commissions them. He tells them what to do. He reveals their will to them from the empty tomb. Behold the place to behold his presence in Galilee. And they followed him to Galilee. It was there that he revealed his will that you're not to sit in the upper room in fear. You're to go and do my work and extend my kingdom. And then he doesn't leave them without help. Because I want you to look at Luke chapter 24. Behold not only his, the place and his presence, but behold the promise. Look what it says in Luke chapter 24 and verse 49. If you turn over and look at it yourself, you'll see it. The Lord wants you to see this. So if he wants you to see it, then he wants you to turn to it in his word. He wants you to look at it in scripture. So take your Bible just now. If you put it into the front row on you, the little area where the Bible and the hymn book is, just lift it out. Just take it now and have a look at Luke 24. Turn to verse 49. Look what he says, and behold, there is another behold in connection with the resurrection. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye are endued with power from on high. Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem, until you are endued with power from on high, I send the promise of the Father upon you. The resurrection of Christ not only means pardon for sin, that's what you have, but it also means power for service. No Christian should ever be overcome continually by sin. I'm not saying you'll not be defeated by sin. I'm not saying you'll fall, you'll not fall foul to the devil and to temptation. We will, we have, and we most likely will do again. But I'm saying to you, we will not continually lie down in defeat. We will not surrender to our passions. We will not give in to the devil. We will not throw the towel in when it comes to fighting the Lord's battles. The child of God is not left to themselves. You're empowered. You're endued with power from on high. It's a wonderful thing to be filled with the Spirit. I preached on it on Tuesday night at the prayer meeting for those that were present. Reasons why we need to be filled with the Spirit. I outlined those reasons. One, because of the warfare that we're engaged in. We're in a battle against the devil. We're in a battle against deception. We're in a battle against the depravity of our own hearts. That's why I say to you, child of God, you need to be empowered and endued with the promise of the Father. The Father has promised, and he cannot lie. The Spirit 
to them that ask. And you've only to ask in faith, believing, and the Lord will fill you with his spirit, and you'll be able to live the Christian life. You can't do anything for the Lord, and you cannot serve the Lord unless you're saved by his grace and you're filled with his spirit. Now, here's the test this morning. This is resurrection day. You've beheld the place. You've beheld his person. But tell me, have you received the promise? As you sit in God's house right now, can you now answer it in the confines of your own heart and mind? Can you honestly say, sitting right here now before the Lord, look the Lord in the face and answer the question. Yes, Lord, I'm filled with the Spirit. My friends, listen to me. You have every right to stop me every Sunday morning, every Tuesday night, or any other time these doors are open and I'm here to preach. You have every right, and you can do it. You can do it. And you have my word in that. You can do it. You can stop me coming in through those doors. I'm not saying you can interrupt the service, but if you did, and as I was coming up these steps, and you just says, Reverend Martin, I need to ask a question. Are you filled with the Spirit today? And I would need to answer honestly. And if I was to say to you, no, this service is over. This service is over. For I'm no good to you. I will preach from my notes professionally. I will just go through a cosmetic exercise. I may have compassion naturally, as many do. I may even be sincere. I may even be scripturally sound, doctrinally true, theologically right. I'll tick every box. But that word will never impact you. It will never motivate or move you. It will never stir your heart. I could not and would not be the Lord's messenger in the Lord's message if I'm not filled with the Holy Spirit. Every preacher today must answer to God for their ministry. And I think one of the first questions, one of them, not the first, but one of them, did you seek the promise of the Father? Oh, you've been to the empty tomb. Your sins are forgiven. You've met with the Lord. You know his will for your life. But did you receive the Holy Ghost? Are you filled right now with the Spirit of God? If you say to me, preacher, how do I know Well, have you never been filled before? You've never received the Holy Ghost. You've never had power for service. I outlined on Tuesday evening exactly how, I'm not going to do it now, exactly how you and I can be filled with the Spirit. We'll have that message, God willing, uploaded to the internet, and you can listen to it. The vessel needs to be clean, purged from all sin. And having been cleansed in the blood, I practice it every Sunday morning and evening in this house and it's deliberate to teach you that I need the Holy Spirit to preach and you need the Holy Ghost to work for Christ, to serve him. The resurrection of Christ not only means pardon for sin, it's not a ticket to heaven. It's power for service that you could serve the Lord. Tell me, are you filled with the Spirit now? Are you endued with power from on high? Do you have the anointing of God on your life? Each and every day, confess your sin. Tell the Lord you're sorry. Seek for forgiveness. Ask for cleansing and washing. And the moment you believe that God has forgiven your sin on the ground of the finished work and shed blood of the Lamb, then immediately say, Lord, I'm a candidate now for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I ask you now, Father, give to me in Jesus' name the infilling of the Holy Spirit of God. Give me power to serve. Give me that anointing and give me that endowment and that empowerment and that enablement from on high that I may talk of thee, share thee with my fellow man, serve thee with all of my heart, overcome the devil, overcome the world, defeat sin in my life, say no to temptation and live to please thee and do what's right in your sight. Behold the place, behold his presence, behold the promise. I want you to think finally of behold the prospect. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 1 and we'll finish here, by the way. This is the last one and we'll use it as a conclusion. Acts chapter 1 and it's verses 10 and 11. 
And you remember now the Lord's about to ascend into heaven after his resurrection, after he has given them the promise of the Spirit, empowered and anointed his people to serve him. Look what it says. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? And you can take the word behold in these words now. Behold, this same Jesus which is taken from you into heaven shall come in like manner, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Behold, this same Jesus shall come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Christ is not only risen, Christ is not only commissioned, Christ has not only empowered his servants and his children and his church, but Christ is coming back one day. And I want to tell you, that day is very soon. We don't know how long this earth will last. We don't know. We could measure maybe the Lord's coming in single years. And I mean that. It could be double figures, yes, or triple. We don't know. But I would imagine we could truthfully say the coming of the Lord is so near that it could be single figures. A few years left on planet earth. Everything is coming together now. Things have happened in the last 10 years that I tell you it wasn't possible for the Lord to return until those things happened. And those things now have happened. They're in place now. And the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. And it could be in a few years time. No one knows the time. No one knows the day. We know that. But I'm saying to you, it's very near. He's at the door. The angel has the trumpet to his mouth and his eyes are to the throne of God and the Lord just indicating with a movement to blow the trumpet and the last trump will sound and time will be no more and the Lord will burst into the scene of history and history will climax in the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. And the Lord says, Behold, he's coming back again. These are the beholds that are associated with the resurrection. For the child of God, the Lord's coming will bring prospect. It will bring praise. It will bring pleasure. But for the unconverted, I want to tell you, it will not bring any of those things. It will bring no praise. It will bring no prospect. It will bring no pleasure. The coming of the Lord for those who were out of Christ without a Savior, let me tell you what it will bring. It will bring perdition. And punishment, that's right. It will bring horror and hell. It will bring terror and torment. It will bring despair and darkness. It will bring fear and flame. It will bring suffering and sorrow. And it will be final. And it will be forever. And that's why today... I say to you, if you're unconverted, behold the place. Look at it today. Focus your attention. That's where your salvation lies. And the fact that there's an empty tomb, there's a risen Savior who is willing and able to save you today. Forgive your sin only on the ground of his finished work, his precious shed blood. The experience of that salvation will be yours only as you repent of your sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and receive him into your heart. There are many other beholds in Scripture and I leave them with you as I close. The Lord Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Behold the Savior standing at your heart's door. I want to tell you, that heart is like that tomb. It's empty. Christ is not there. And he never was there. Because like that stone, it has never been rolled away. Not to let the Savior out, but to let the Savior in. And you need to open your heart's door to Christ today and be saved. The Bible says, behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. You know what the Bible says? Behold, or lo, 
a great multitude, which no man could number, stood before the throne of God and before the Lamb, washed in the blood of the Lamb. And then there is another, behold, over in the book of the Revelation, chapter 20, while it doesn't say it, it implies it. It's, John says, I saw, I beheld a great white throne and the living dead, the wicked dead, stood before the great white throne judgment and the books were opened. I want you to behold those that were not found written in the book of life were cast into the lake of fire. I want you to see that today. Behold the place, an empty tomb, a risen Savior, he can be saved. And here's the presence. He'll go with you in the Christian life. He'll give you and reveal to you his will. And here's the promise. He'll fill you with his spirit to live the Christian life. And here's the prospect, heaven and eternity with Christ. Consider the beholds of the resurrection. Father in heaven, do bless now thy precious word to all of our hearts. Grant, Lord, that in hearing the word, it will benefit us, being mixed with faith in them that hear it. Prosper the word now to every soul, saved and unsaved alike. Speak to my heart, speak to our hearts today. And Father, save the lost. Restore the backslider, revive the church, and glorify thy dear Son. Take of our thanks now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We'll turn to the hymn 119 in closing. 119 in closing. Again, it may not be a familiar hymn, but there should be a familiar tune at least to it. I think it's come, or it's uh, Guide Me, O Thy Great Jehovah. So after the singing of the first verse, I'll make my way to the door. Those that have to leave can do so, and the rest can remain at uh, your own will for the communion service. Thank you.